Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, sensitive interviewing. And there are a couple of different ways we could define or conceptualise sen sensitive interviewing. Uh, there is some literature in the research methods literature on sensitive interviewing. And for the most part, that literature defines sensitive interviewing as interviews that cover emotionally difficult topics. But you could also define sensitive interviews as interviews that cover deeply private, deeply personal topics, things that people might find difficult to talk about, issues that might be stigmatised. Um, you might be doing research with vulnerable communities, with um, children. Um, there's uh, a little bit of literature into doing research with people with dementia, um, for instance. Or you might be doing research where, if there's an issue with confidentiality, your research might have serious consequences for the people um, involved. Uh, I'm largely going to be talking about interviews that cover emotionally difficult topics. Um, so this raises a couple of issues. One, it highlights the, ex the way that people experience being interviewed, the way that people experience being a participant in, in research. It also highlights that doing um, research can have an impact upon researchers. Now our research has, our last two projects, have involved doing research with clinical negligence claimants. These are people who have been injured as a result of a medical procedure um, and they've attempted to, to sue their healthcare provider. Um, most of the people that we've interviewed have been quite seriously injured. Some people have, some claimants have sued because they've lost a child, uh, they may have lost a spouse, they may have lost a parent. Um, in one case we have a husband who's lost both his, his wife and the baby. Um, we have some people who have been seriously um, physically injured, a couple of people with serious brain damage, and so the claimant then is a, is a relative. Um, and then we have some other quite life-changing physical injuries, double amputees, um, for instance. So really difficult interviews. Um, most of the literature on sensitive interviewing covers those two topics, how do people experience being interviewed, and then how does that affect you as a, a researcher. But for me, sensitive interviewing also goes towards some deeper issues to do with interviewing, some ethical issues, some issues to do with power. Um, and these topics are going to be picked up a little bit further um, next week um, by Tammy. Um, Tammy Krauss is also involved um, in our research. She was um, one of our research assistants and she's done quite a lot um, of these interviews. Okay. So there is some literature in the research, um, social science research literature, about what it's like to be involved in a project. Uh, for instance, Campbell has gone and re-interviewed people who had participated in interviews about um, being a survivor of rape. Uh, so she went back and she asked people, um, you participated in our initial study, how did you find being involved in that research? Um, and she provides, or they provide, um, some pieces of, of advice if you want to do um, quite difficult um, interviews. One is you need to be prepared. You need to do your background reading. Um, the survivors of rape had stressed that researchers need to be aware of the impact of rape. They need to have done that work beforehand. You also need to be practised. It's probably not advisable if you haven't done interviewing before, to really cut your teeth on very sensitive interviews. One of the reasons why we were particularly keen to get Tammy as a research assistant is she's quite practiced in very difficult interviews. Um, Tammy next week will be talking about her own PhD work and that's um, involving families of murder victims. Um, so we wanted somebody who's particularly practiced as well. Um, and I did the other sets of interviews, and I've done some fairly difficult interviews um, over the years. So I've interviewed survivors of rape, domestic violence. I've interviewed people about when they've discovered their child was being sexually abused, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you also need to be patient. Um, these interviews can take quite a long time. Um, I did an interview two years ago, which was it wasn't a clinical negligence project, but somebody who had tried to sue their lawyer 
um, again, a very difficult uh, topic. Um, that interview took five hours. Um, I spent the week after that seven hours with somebody in a, a law firm just going through their file. Um, so sometimes these things can take quite a bit of time. Participants in Campbell's study um, stress that rape can happen to any woman, um, that the impact varies on each individual, and therefore researchers shouldn't be surprised by that variability, um, that you shouldn't, um, shouldn't feel as if there's some sort of normative experience. Um, that participants didn't want to feel as if their experiences were being judged against the experiences of, of other participants. Recovery from rape is a long, slow process, and that you might be talking to women at different stages of this process. Um, sometimes with sensitive interviews, we find that we're talking to somebody, and this is the first time they've really talked in depth about that particular issue. Other times, and the clinical negligence um, claimants were, were probably at, at the other end. This is a story that they tell a lot um, and tell over and over. It's something that has become very central to somebody's identity. Um, but you might get somebody anywhere along that, that continuum. Participants say that they appreciate empathy and of course in sensitive interviewing developing that empathy, having that rapport is important. But nevertheless you cannot fully appreciate a survivor's lived experiences. So one of the things that I try to avoid when I'm doing interviews is saying, I understand how you feel, because ultimately I don't. Um, and I, I, I find that that just breaks, um, breaks empathy. I can say, that sounds very difficult, um, that sounds like it would have been really difficult, um, but I can't say, I know how you feel. Um, so ultimately, there still is a gap between academic knowledge and somebody's personal experiences. So participants don't feel comfortable necessarily if you try and artificially close that gap. Um, participants say that researchers need to be comfortable so that they feel as if they can talk openly. Um, and sometimes when you're doing an interview, you really are listening to um, somebody telling a very, very difficult story. And that can be quite upsetting even at the time. Um, but part participants say, look, it's still my story. You need to put a boundary around your own emotions at the time. Um, you know, come back to it, but not during the interview itself. Um, so to some degree, you need to be able to approach these interviews um, and be a little tough about it, I, I guess, be able to cope with it at the time. In a similar article, Goodrum and Keyes went and re-interviewed relatives of murder victims and women who had had abortions um, about their particip participation in research. Again, it was stressed that um, participants were at different stages of that grief process, reactions were highly individualised. Again, stressed that participants didn't want to feel as if they'd been judged against some sort of norm. Um, it wasn't always possible to predict what topics might cause distress. Um, you, because individual reactions can be quite different, you don't always know which question um, might produce a very strong reaction. Um, again, interviewees said that they need the researcher to be comfortable um, in that research role and that if they feel as if the researcher is becoming upset, there's a tendency to change topics or to stop talking. Um, or to feel as if they're no longer being listened to. Um, so again, there's, there's that need to, to put your own emotions to the one side. Piloting your interview questions can be quite useful for highlighting some terms that might be problematic. Um, Goodrum and Keyes found that the term closure was very difficult. Looking at um, some of our transcripts, we also found that um, clinical negligence claimants um, had reacted against that term closure. Um, solicitors in some cases had said, okay, if you sue, you may not win. Um, the chances are you won't win. Um, most medical negligence claims are withdrawn. It's a very difficult area to, to get any sort of settlement. However, you might get an explanation. You might know what, what went wrong. You might get some sort of closure. Um, and unfortunately, medical negligence law doesn't offer that. 
the only settlement you can really get in a medical negligence claim is a financial compensation. Um, you're most likely not going to get an explanation. You're not going to force your healthcare provider, the hospital or the doctor, to provide you with an apology. Um, if you don't get that financial compensation, you very often don't get anything. And so the claimants were saying, I didn't get closure. Um, it was never going to happen. My lawyer wasn't up front with me. Um, piloting also gives you an opportunity to test the order of your questions. Um, Goodrum and Keyes found that it's possibly best to avoid asking emotional questions early on. They also found that the way that they set up their recruitment material was particularly important in this type of, of interviews. Um, your recruitment material does need to be sensitive. It needs to be written in a way that appreciates perhaps you're asking people to talk about experiences um, that might be stigmatised, um, experiences that people often don't talk about or are found very difficult to talk about. Our um, clinical negligence claimants have invariably sued because they felt as if somebody hasn't listened to them. They felt as if most of them have tried to make a complaint, most of them made a formal complaint, and they feel as if that complaint wasn't listened to. And so they've tried to go to court in order to get their story heard. Um, so it might be that you want to say on the recruitment material we use is an information sheet that we send out and then a written consent form. You might want to say on that written information sheet, um, this is a, um, we, we're interested in listening to your story. Um, the recruitment material for sensitive interviews probably needs some fairly specific information. Tell people what topics you are likely to, to raise. Don't take people by surprise. Um, perhaps give the initial order of questions so that people are prepared. They know what questions are going to come up first. Um, tell people about the length of the interview. It gives an idea of just how far into the topics you, you might go. We find that on our recruitment material, even if we do provide this um, specific information, um, I will still get a flush of phone calls the second people receive the recruitment information. And it's asking me the same questions. What are the topics? What order of topics? How long is this interview likely to ask? And I suspect that um, people at this stage aren't really asking me for the facts of, of that, you know, what are we actually going to do in the interview. I think they're just testing to see whether I sound sympathetic, um, whether I sound as if I'm, I'm going to listen. Um, so we'd always have that, those contact um, numbers as, as well. Um, so that's a couple of articles about how people um, experience um, participating in, in research. The other issue that often comes up in the literature is how emotional interviews impact upon you as a researcher. Hostchild, a sociologist who's looked at um, the work of air hostesses, um, coined the term emotional work um, and Dixon and Smith then apply that to doing interviews, argue that doing interviews is a form of emotional work. It takes an emotional toll upon you. Um, Clement and Cox say that sometimes doing interviews leaves you feeling as if the interviewee is living inside your head. And there have certainly been times when I've finished an interview and it's as if I almost continue that conversation with the, the interviewee. You know, I, I go and have a cup of tea and I can still hear that person in my head. And some of the really difficult interviews, I will come back and I'll read the transcript and I can hear that voice again in, in my head. I have interviewees um, from years ago that live in my head. <laughs> um, and sometimes you need to get that voice out of your head. Um, so you can sometimes carry the, emotionals, the emotions of an interview long after the research has finished. And this can make you feel... It can make you feel isolated. It can make you feel emotionally overloaded. Uh, I remember, obviously I'm Australian, I'm doing a project um, in Australia. We had been looking at um, highly contested family law cases. Almost all of these involved domestic violence. A lot involved allegations of child abuse. And I had done child abuse case after child abuse case after child abuse case. It was six weeks of really difficult files every day. I remember walking around in a supermarket going, all of you are sick, everybody. 
And I, I rang the, the um, PI at this point and said, look, I've, I've just got to come back to Sydney. I am losing it. <laughs> I, I've just lost um, perspective. I'm just feeling completely emotionally overloaded. I need to have a break. Um, so one of the reasons we're doing clinical negligence is I'm needing a, a break from family law and child law, so I've done clinical negligence <laughs> um, instead. Okay, Dixon and Swift went and did interviews with people who do interviews. Um, so interviewed people who do sensitive interviews um, <coughs> for a job. They found that sometimes researchers can feel uneasy at the level of disclosure. Um, and I've personally felt that at times. You're talking to somebody that ultimately you don't really know, um, and yet this person is telling you the sort of deepest, darker its secrets. They're telling you something that's incredibly personal. And sometimes I think, do you really know what I'm going to do with that? <laughs> do you know that I'm going to analyse that in a way that ultimately you're not going to be able to recognise your own individual story? Do you know that I'm going to write that up? Do you know that I'm perhaps going to be critical of the way that clinical negligence um, claimants um, represent their, their stories? Do you ultimately know what I'm going to do with your story, your deeply personal story that you're trusting me with? So some researchers have said that sometimes they feel uneasy doing sensitive interviews. Some others say that they feel as if at least they're listening, at least they're paying respect to somebody's story, particularly if that story hasn't been heard um, before. Um, particularly if interviewees say that they welcomed the opportunity to talk. And certainly in most of our research we would find people saying, look, that was a, a difficult interview but I really appreciated being able to talk. Um, particularly if you do a lot of interviews and a lot in a row, you can walk away feeling desensitised as if you're really no longer paying attention, emotional attention to somebody's story. They're just yet another interview. Um, they can make you sometimes feel vulnerable yourself or with a heightened sense of your own mortality. Sometimes you, you tend to make a connection between that interview and your own life and that can make um, things quite difficult. Tammy, who will be here next week, had a real problem with one interview, I remember. Tammy and I have, we, we sort of have a code if one of us gets an email saying, I need chocolate. Usually that means I've just done a really difficult um, interview and we both have a secret stash of chocolate. Um, so if you see us in the staff room having a cup of tea and a bar of chocolate, we're having a hard day. <laughs> um, so there was one interview Tammy did where she was talking to um, a gentleman who had lost his wife. She had died of cancer and quite a lot of our cases are delayed or misdiagnosis of cancer. Um, and... Um, he also had two sons who were the same age as Tammy's children, um, roughly. And so there's that sort of making a connection um, can be quite difficult. Um, and for some interviews, um, for interviewers, um, doing difficult research can be life-changing. Um, Dixon Smith offers some further advice. It's useful sometimes to keep a clear boundary about what you as a researcher can offer somebody. Sometimes when you contact somebody about doing research, particularly if it's research with children, um, they can perceive that this is a promise to change something. And you can't necessarily do that. And this is something we are particularly aware of. Um, because we work in a law school, people think that perhaps we can represent their legal case Perhaps we can um, change the outcome of a claim. Perhaps we can give legal advice. Of course, I can't. I'm a sociologist. <laughs> so we need to be very clear about um, this is research. Um, the very best we can offer somebody is to listen to their story. That really is the, the only thing that I can offer. I can't change anything. Um, sometimes we'll get asked... Um, for the recommendation of a lawyer. You know, I'll get asked if I can give legal advice, which of course I can't do. Um, but then I'll have somebody say, look, I'm very unhappy with the legal advice that I got. Can you recommend a good lawyer? I can't even do that. So the best I can do is to give um, the website of the Law Society and say, here's the Law Society's website. It has a list of specialists um, in the field. Um, you'll find somebody in your local area. 
We would keep a, a contact list um, for our clinical negligence project. We contacted the counselling service and they helped us put up um, a list of useful people that we, we might want to refer somebody to, which included counselling support. Um, and I found the counselling service here to be excellent for talking a project over. Um, again, it's useful to do that background reading before you, you do the interview. This is research where you really do need to plan ahead. Um, practice um, your interviewing skills um, before you do the interviews, and we will role play uh, a little bit. Um, it is useful to hold regular meetings to review the research, but also just to talk things out, um, to share perhaps those interview techniques. Um, one of the things I do as an interviewer is I would type up the first transcript, very often myself, um, of my first interview, and then I would check to see my relationship um, with the person I've interviewed. I'd check to see that I've got my questions open enough. I'd check to see that I haven't cut people off. Um, so I constantly check back my own interview technique. Um, but I also find it quite useful if I'm interviewing with somebody um, to talk about that technique. And Tammy and I have our own um, interviewing technique. We have our own style, uh, I guess. But it's useful <coughs> to go through reflexive exercises um, to articulate that. Um, particularly with this type of research, it's useful to then have um, strategies in place to allow you to emotionally debrief. And this concept of emotional debriefing is developed a little bit more by Beale, who explained that debriefing is a chance to express your emotions, to talk out how these interviews are making you feel, to make sense of what otherwise might seem inexplicable. Obviously, in the town that I was working at, where I really had a bit of an emotional meltdown over my family law cases, um, I was struggling to make that make sense. So going back to the office, talking to the other researchers in the team really helped. You do tend to reflect and compare the interviewee's experiences against your own life, and it helps to be able to talk that out with a, another researcher to keep perhaps a diary or a journal that lists that, that allows you to articulate how you're feeling. Um, emotional sensitive interviewing tends to work best if you're working in a fairly egalitarian um, working model. If you're a PhD student, it is useful if your supervisor is readily available, that you can just knock on the door, know that they have you have somebody to talk to. And if you don't have that, um, there are some other things that might be useful. Perhaps setting up a research mentor, somebody else um, around who does this type of research, um, who can provide you with someone to talk to, um, basically. <laughs> so you have somebody on the end of the email for when you say, I need some chocolate. <laughs> um, you have somebody that, that you can discuss that with. Um, generally, in the literature in particular, when we talk about the impact of emotional sensitive interviews, we tend to talk about that impact on researchers themselves, on the person who's done the interview. But there are, of course, other people often involved in a research project. Um, Julie Boyd from the law school did our transcripts for us, and she's fabulous. She's a really good transcriber. And what makes Julie such a good transcriber is she really listens to the interviews. So she's not just typing them up um, word for word. She's also listening for that intent. She's making sure she's got the meaning right. Um, and that, of course, means then that Julie is fully exposed to that emotional impact on the interviews. She hasn't done the interviews herself, but she has to read them and listen to them. And I'm afraid transcribing over and over again. Um, and so that's going to have an emotional impact. If you have a supervisor, a supervisor might need to have good listening skills. They need to provide you with opportunities to debrief. But they might also need to debrief themselves. Um, so just reading your transcripts and talking about that can have an emotional impact. Um, we tend to, to, I tend to think fairly hard about how somebody will read my work. We're just finishing off the, the first article from this and it's got some really full-on quotes in it. Um, and sometimes that can have a positive effect in that it will get it read um, if we're doing quite a lot of policy work. It can make the government pay attention, so it can have policy impact. Um, but you also sometimes run the risk that people will see the echoes in their own lives in a negative way. So I'm quite careful with 
the reading material that I use, for instance, when I teach. Um, so I teach child law. I, I cover issues such as child abuse, um, the impact of separation and divorce on children. Um, so I'm fairly careful um, to choose articles that won't necessarily reactivate those, those echoes in my own students' um, minds. There are, of course, then some deeper issues to do with interviewing, and this is, is the, the theme that, that Temi will pick up next week. Um, and the deeper issues, I think, largely revolve around power. Uh, there can be a power imbalance, and there invariably is a power imbalance between interviewers and interviewee. Um, in sensitive interviews, you potentially are interviewing somebody who's feeling very isolated, feeling as if this is a very difficult or a stigmatised topic um, to talk about, who hasn't really spoken to, to anybody else about this. So that can be really quite difficult. Um, and I think it is questionable whether people really do understand when they provide consent exactly what they're consenting for. We can give that information sheet, we can give as much information as we can about that research. We always try and make sure we've got fully informed consent. But does somebody really know how then the, the depth of which those questions are going to, to expose somebody's personal um, experiences and then what happens once I start to write that up. And I'm afraid I have made a career out of publishing um, people's grief. Um, so Dara, had I, by appearing to have greater respect for and equality with the participants when seeking their consent and when playing the part of a researcher, been exploiting them in a deeper sense? Um, so this is an issue that um, Tammy will, will pick up later. But sometimes you do get that sense of guilt of, well, I can walk away from this interview. Ultimately, this isn't my life. Um, I will publish this and move on. Okay, so I've, I've pointed towards our research, but I'll just give you a little bit more detail about it. Um, we have two projects. Um, looking at the experiences of clinical negligence claimants. One is a small-scale pilot funded by Nuffield Foundation, which is based here. Um, one is a Scottish project funded by the Scottish Government, Scottish Executive. Scotland has been exploring whether they're going to a no-fault clinical negligence scheme. Um, and so we were commissioned to provide research um, for the working group examining that. <coughs> Oh, on this slide, I said there's four previous studies. I actually found a fifth yesterday. There's <laughs> five previous studies anywhere into the experiences of clinical negligence um, claimants. There is an awful lot of research looking at the views of doctors, doctors who have been sued. Um, so there's a whole body of research there. And we know that being sued is very difficult for a doctor. Um, however, we tend to only have one side of the story. Um, there's very limited research on the experiences of clinical negligence claims, the person who's been injured, the other side of the story. Um, there's only been one study done in the UK, and all of these studies, including the one that I found yesterday, <laughs> have been based on surveys. We're the first research to have done in-depth qualitative um, interviews. And of course, we thought it was quite important to do qualitative interviews. These are people who have sued because they felt as if they haven't told their story. And so we wanted a methodology that we thought was appropriate to allowing people to tell their story. We thought we knew that we were going to ask questions on very emotionally difficult topics. And so we didn't want to just create a sort of tick the box exercise. We wanted a method that um, was appropriate to the topic that, that we were using. We didn't want people to feel as if they were rushed. We wanted them to at least, if we can't change anything, to feel as if they were listened to. So we chose in-depth um, interviews. So it's the first study um, to, to have done that. Um, and the interviews have been difficult. Uh, this is a quote from a woman who's just watched her husband die, um, another misdiagnosis of cancer. And then he just sat up and he looked like, you know the scream. Edward Monk's um, picture, and just this massive, massive spurt of blood came out, and he was just like this, and then he died. And they still wouldn't let me in the ambulance. They left me on the road, then they let me in the ambulance, and he died. And I said, I think you ought to close his eyes, he's passed away. And they started giving him CPR, and there wasn't anything of him. It would have broken all his ribs. They were just being so rough. They wouldn't close his eyes, they wouldn't. 
They wouldn't stop doing that on his chest, and they did that all the way to the hospital. And I begged them not to, just to leave him in peace. And then they wouldn't even cover his face when he went through A&E. And all the people were just looking at him, and he died. And I thought it was just so cruel. I just thought that was so cruel and undignified. Um, so we, we have um, a total of 60 interviews, um, and a lot of them are really difficult interviews. Okay, we, um, we managed to find our claimants via solicitors. Um, the other projects that have been done have gone through the healthcare service. Um, so the UK study went through the NHS. Um, we went through solicitors. <coughs> we couldn't contact people directly. Um, the Data Protection Act means that solicitors can't give us the personal details of their clients directly. Um, and most solicitors are reluctant to do that anyway because of client confidentiality. So the solicitor firms volunteered um, to send out our information and contact sheets to um, claimants. Um, the solicitors acted as gatekeepers. Um, so there were some clients we knew weren't contacted because the solicitors felt that um, the case was too raw, um, that the claimant was just too upset, the claimant had a terminal illness, um, maybe suffered from a psychiatric disorder and wouldn't be able to answer our questions. We are also aware that at least one firm didn't want us to contact people who were particularly disgruntled with the legal service that they provided. So we have a, a, a somewhat biased sample. We don't know how many people um, weren't contacted so undoubtedly we have bias, but we have an unknown response rate and an unknown bias as, as well. Um, but regardless, if we'd gone through the NHS, we would have had another gatekeeper. Um, and so this is, is research where it's very difficult to contact people directly. Um, so we sent out written information forms. Um, that gave people time <coughs> to read the information forms, time to, to ring us, time to make up their minds. Um, the problem with contacting people this way is the consent rate. We, uh, uh, we would have sent out, we sent out a pack that also contained a reply paid envelope so people would pop their consent form and post it back to me. That technique is notorious <laughs> for people not sending you back the consent form. Guaranteed the lowest response rate. Um, so the way that you get around this is often to send, up, send out a reminder form or to do that twice. Um, we took the view that we didn't want to do that, that we didn't want people to feel as if they were in any way being pressured into this research. So we didn't do any type of follow-up. We assumed if you haven't got back to us straight away, you don't want to be involved. It may be that you've forgotten, um, but we, we didn't want to, to follow up. Took us a while to get to the most appropriate interview style. Um, we wanted very open-ended um, interviews, but particularly people had told this story a lot. It was something that they tell themselves a lot. Um, and so we found it difficult to get people to talk about topics that was away from that very familiar retold story. Um, people would tell in a lot of detail what went wrong what happened with the actual injury. But it was a lot harder to get them to talk about the relationship with their solicitor. And that was one of the central things that we were interested in because that's not a part of people's familiar stories. Um, so that took um, some work. Um, we, to some degree, we followed people's narratives. Um, we didn't use, we used a very unstructured um, interview schedule. We pretty much started the interviews by saying, tell me what happened, um, and then following through. Sometimes, because these are stories that people tend to tell and retell, um, there seemed to be a sense of, well, you should already know the background. You know, and somebody's telling you something that they tell a lot, and they assume that, that you, you already know um, the beginning. Um, so at times I'd have to stop and say, okay, can, can we just go back a couple of steps? Can, hang on, I'm, I've, I've lost track. Can, can you fill me in? So being able to get that sort of extra detail without interrupting. And we did find the second we'd stop and ask a more structured question, we'd lose rapport. Um, people um, struggled if we sort of interrupted that familiar story. So in other times we'd just leave somebody to talk. Um, and then at the end 
would come back and try and fill in the story. So sometimes I think, I've no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but hopefully, by the end of the interview, I, I, will, I, I will understand. Um, we needed somebody with experience. Um, Tammy, of course, is doing a PhD. Um, and so I keep trying to push her into doing other research, which is not her PhD research, which is not a popular thing in a school that's trying to get completions on time. <laughs> um, and if we had lost Tammy, it would have been really difficult to have done this, this research. There were too many interviews for me to have done myself. Um, and we would have been struggling to find somebody with the experience. I wouldn't have um, asked somebody without experience to have done these, these interviews. And I'm not entirely sure whether the funders would have been happy with us doing that either. Some of the interviews were very long, and so we've needed to plan that in. And also you need time to recover between the interviews. Um, we had a bad day where or Tammy had tried to do too many interviews in the one day. And she got to the point that she just felt as if she wasn't listening to what people were, were saying. Um, there's only so many of these you can do without really needing a break. Setting up the interviews was also quite difficult and required quite a bit of flexibility from us. Some people wanted somebody else with them. Um, they wanted a friend or they wanted a relative with them. Clinical negligence claims are often, we have found, um, often seem to, to come about when a friend or a relative has pushed the claimant into seeing a solicitor. So there's very often a support person um, and sometimes they wanted that support person with the interview. Other times they wanted to just talk to us completely alone as if this was a private um, moment where they can really just talk about themselves. Um, and anything where you're needing those sorts of conditions will take time. Um, the contact sheet needed to have all the information. It needed to be detailed. It needed to explain the topics we were likely to, to talk about. We did most of these interviews, not all of them, most as telephone interviews. Um, I try to avoid face-to-face -to -face too much if I can, largely because of safety issues. Um, the Scottish interviews involve claimants right across Scotland, so the practicalities there of, of too much travelling um, was going to be difficult as, as well. And so we were worried about whether we could get the rapport that we needed um, over the telephone. Um, but I think we managed to do that. The issue with the retold story is trying to get um, people to answer, um, to talk about things that usually um, aren't a central part of their story. Um, of course, we couldn't make a difference to an individual's case, so we had to be very careful about setting that, that boundary. In some cases, and I hate to say this on tape as well, we didn't like the people we were talking to. And you get this in interviews. So you're having to try and establish rapport and to be empathic when you think, I really don't like you. <laughs> um, so, you know, previous research, I've done research with people, uh, with people who are explaining to me how they, for instance, beat up a woman and she deserved it. Um, or you're interviewing somebody who's, I've, I've done some interviews with, you know, pimps and um, rapists, etc. And sometimes you don't like these people. Um, but nevertheless, you're needing to, again, put that emotion to one side um, to allow somebody to talk, even when you've got an internal dialogue. So sometimes I'm having to just turn that internal voice off. I will then email Temi saying, I need a bar of chocolate. <laughs> we'll sit in the staff room, have a cup of tea, and I'll say, look, I've just done an interview and I really didn't like it. <laughs> but I need to put that to, to the one side. Okay, that should be it. Um, are there any questions?